Welcome, everybody, to the showing of uh, Sir No Sir by uh, uh, David Zeiger, a, a film about the anti-war movement within the military uh, and the veterans community during the, uh, the Vietnam War. Uh, we're going to stream the film, and then at about 6 o'clock, uh, the director is going to pop in, and uh, you'll have a chance to ask questions of him uh, in uh, an open Q&A. He'll be on the, the Zoom call. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and stream the film. It is uh, just under uh, an hour and a half, so we should be right on time. Okay. So, let's see what so, David, do you mind uh, unmuting there? Uh, sorry about that. Yeah. That's that's fine. Um, so, you know, we've got about a dozen people live here in the room, and it looks like about uh, four um, uh, attendees over, over Zoom. So, about 15 in all. Um, uh, and uh, I'd like to ask if anybody has any questions. Yeah, why is it? Oh, thanks. That's a great idea. No, you can't. <laughs> there we go. Now you're you're large on the screen, and I'm small, which is the way it ought to be. So, do you mind uh, hitting some lights for us as well, Liza? Glasses with a flare. So I, I have a couple questions I'm going to ask, but I'd, I'd like to actually uh, start with our uh, attendees here and, and ask if there's anything uh, that came up as they were watching the film. Yeah, Ava? I have a question. Um, so I see a lot, like, there's some music about, like, the anti-war movement and stuff. Like, how influential was that in, like, promoting the movement amongst soldiers? So, Aiden uh, wants to know, he's one of my students, uh, by the way, uh, he wants to know um, uh, how influential uh, you see the uh, the music of the anti-war movement uh, um, uh, in uh, promoting the movement amongst uh, the GIs. Wait, how, uh, say that one more time? Sorry. How influential was the, uh, the, the sort of soundtrack of the anti-war movement uh, for the GIs who were involved in the, uh, in the movement? Um. Music, well, I mean, it, music was just as, as important to GIs as it was to uh, to everyone else, you know, all young people in the country. Um, and actually, it's a good question. I mean, there were um, a number of songs that became very popular uh, among the GIs. We Gotta Get Out of This Place was one of them. Um, we actually, oddly enough, believe it or not, we played that in my class this morning. Uh, did you really? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, and I told them that that was uh, broadly considered to be the uh, the the song of the Vietnam veteran that uh, yeah. that I've read yeah. that if you were performing for uh, for uh, soldiers and you didn't know that song, you might as well get off the stage because you were about to get booed off. Right. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, there were other songs. There was uh, Country Joe McDonald, uh, Country Joe and the Fish had a song, Kiss My Ass. Well, actually, they, they actually had one song called Kiss My Ass that was not uh, distributed broadly, but was distributed among GIs. Um, uh, and, and of course, there was... Um, uh, what's the one the one that was popular? I forgot the name. But uh, anyway, uh, you know, yes, music music did play did play a big role, and, and from all different kinds. I mean, um, one of the things at the uh, the the GI coffee houses, uh, I I worked at at uh, the Oleo Strut, which is featured in the uh, in the film, um, and we would have uh, performers coming both nationally and. Uh, locally, I mean, there were people, I, I, there was a, a very, uh, at the time, a very um, well-known uh, uh, Phil Oaks, uh, who was a very well-known, you know, uh, folk musician that uh, who had a lot of uh, anti-war songs and protest songs. Um, he came, to, he performed at the Oleo Strut and it was packed. And I mean, there were three, 300, 350 guys crammed in there which surprised me because this is a guy who was just, you know, as far as I knew, was kind of mainly known in the folk scene and, and among uh, active anti-war activists on, on campuses. Uh, but that stuff did filter and it did play, it did play a role. It was very important. Do others have uh, questions? 
I have a, a couple that came to mind as I was watching the film, um, uh, and, and I'm sure people people may come in with, with their own as well. Um, I, you're probably familiar with the recent uh, Ken Burns documentary um, that uh, um, uh, came out on P PBS uh, just a couple of years ago. Uh, and, and one thing that, that struck me about it is that this history is not particularly well covered um, uh, in that documentary. Um, uh, and uh, one of the things that that I found, and, and I was reminded of this because Jane Fonda, uh, of course, figures prominently in your film, um, is that I feel the Ken Burns documentary very deliberately maligned her. Um, uh, they, I don't know if, if you recall this scene, but there's a, there's a, a place where they have, um, uh, they've essentially cut together two pieces of Jane Fonda speeches, and they make it appear as though she was cheering for the, um, uh, the killing of American soldiers uh, and happy that they were imprisoned. Um, and then also they they have a, a, an American veteran, and this is presented as though he is a sort of wise person in the film, uh, basically saying uh, that Jane Fonda was really hot and we wanted to sleep with her. And that's why it made us so angry that she joined the anti-war movement. Um, uh, and and this is, you know, in, in the Ken Burns documentary, it really frustrated me. So I, I'm wondering if, it, and, and, and by the way, I don't hate every aspect of that Ken Burns documentary by any means. You know, pieces of it, I think, are actually really good. Uh, but if you have any reaction, any thoughts about why it covered the anti-war movement among soldiers and, and the FTA protests and such uh, as it did. Um, well, it, it, it completely erased the GI movement. And that was intentional. Ken Burns knew very well uh, about the GI movement. He'd seen my film. Uh, he, you know, these guys had researched this, you know, this, this stock, this thing up and down and they intentionally left it out. Not only that, but I, I, I'm curious about what your, your students, you know, might think about the, the section of, of Cerno Sur about the spitting myth, but Ken Burns, uh, promoted that myth fairly prominently, very prominently in the film by at the end of it featuring an anti-war activist, a woman from Columbia University, tearfully apologizing to Vietnam vets for the horrible treatment they got from the anti-war movement with no evidence whatsoever. It, it, it's, it's, and it was, um, to say that it was stressing, distressing that that was kind of how, how he presented all is, um, is an understatement. And, and, and frankly, I think it kind of goes along with a point of view that that Ken Burns was promoting in the film, which was, for one thing, it opened up with the uh, statement that the Vietnam War was started by honorable men with good intentions, meaning the American military and, and government leaders that started it. Um, I would contend with that, uh, that viewpoint, but, uh, but it shaped his whole his whole thinking and his whole presentation. And I think I think the GI movement um, runs counter to to a lot of that point of view. And, and I just think it was very intentionally left out um, as it is from just about every history of the um, of, of the of the Vietnam War, unfortunately. I agree with that. Yeah. Um... Oh, yeah, Shani. Uh, Shani, yeah. I'm not quite sure how to state this question, but near the end of the documentary, uh, that showed the Vietnam vets taking their medals and throwing them. Um, I believe it was in front of the Capitol or the White House Capitol, mm -hmm. and um, yeah. there was a comment one made that the next time we will, it'll be to take over. And I think about currently what's going on with the January 6th uh, sort of assault on our government and how vet, vets are involved in that. Um, there's, there seems to be a, a, a lot of vets that are participating in sort of a revolt. I don't know if you could just comment a little bit on, on that and, and the relationship of those two. Um, it's ironic. Um... <laughs> how things can change their in, in in their meaning depending on what's happening in the world um at the time of the uh uh the, the veterans the the thousand veterans uh going to washington dc and 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 throwing their medals the sentiment in this country among a fairly significant section of the people uh was 
that there needed to be a revolution of some form or another. And they were not talking about what emerged under Donald Trump. They were talking about the oppression of black people. They were talking about uh, the kind of imperialist nature of the United States that is that led to the Vietnam War, um, a number of things like that. It's and I know every time I see that, uh, you know, or, or think about that now, it's 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 I kind of cringe because, you know, what even you know I I don't I don't know what was in the head of that of of that particular vet, but um, that sentiment was coming from a much different place in in 1970 71 when that uh, demonstration happened than than certainly than what was coming from um the uh the 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 forks folks who stormed the capitol um they they were and and to be honest i, I mean i don't know but but i would i would i would certainly believe that the vast that that, that what it, the vietnam vets who were part of that uh january 6th were not uh people who would come out of that uh, out of the vietnam war opposing the war and opposing the the government particularly vets i i can't say that for sure but um but i know that the that the intent and the and the, and the historical the cultural and political context that that happened in was dramatically different from from what it is now um so it like i said it's very interesting how something that's said in one context can turn into quite the opposite in another in another context which is what's going on now Right, something like that. Yeah, so I, um, I'm just wondering. Um, my brother was a, a Vietnam vet. He served in the '68 to from um, '66 to '68, and was at Fort Hood. And he was at Fort Hood when the three that are recognized as being um, resistance, and he was actually among four other vets that also were resistant and when it came to the night before they were going to take them and, and send them to Vietnam, they were given a choice to move from one side of the room to the other side of the room or be imprisoned. And my brother was one of the four that moved and went mm -hmm. to Vietnam. Now it changed his life forever. And I wonder if the vets that, that did go to Vietnam raised children, you know, how our values many times are supported by our parents values and there was a lot of I mean he was never the same when he came back and he always had a chip on his shoulder about America and anyway I, I'm just trying to relate all of that with this generation that is now anyway it's also it's 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 all very interesting for discussion and evaluation I, I don't know if I have a question in there but maybe a comment I yeah, I mean, there's a lot to there's a lot in what you in what you said. Um, I don't know, I, you know how how much people are influenced by their parents is more of a pers uh, in some ways kind of a personal uh, thing than than I don't know than 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 cultural trends. I mean, you know, our our parents were the the the, the uh, World War II generation, and um, you know, there's it, it. It's there is there is a, there's more of a tendency among young, you know, you, young generations coming up to rebel against uh, a lot of what their parents have um, have have tried to teach them or or not. But I do think I, I do know it's I, I, certainly I can tell you. Uh, I mean, with certainly with the guys, the the folks that are in the um, uh, in in my film, I know two of them whose uh, daughters are both very, very active, uh, uh, you know, in in kind of left wing, uh, anti war and anti oppression um, movements and organizations. Um, so I think there I think there has to have been some you know some of that some of that influence I think certainly passed on. Are there other questions from the gallery here? I just want to make one comment that 
when the film was shown here at CU, I think it was 2007, shortly after she was here. I was in the audience, I was in Thailand and India and um, uh, in the Air Force working on planes. And uh, I have a copy of the film. And I uh, also, I recommended it every opportunity that I can um, to the subject, the subject comes up. So I don't know if you could hear this, but uh, Skip, who's in the um, audience here, is uh, is a Vietnam vet, um, mm -hmm. and he was also in Thailand during the war in in the Air Force, um, uh, and uh, and he says he was at the CU premiere in two thousand seven. Um, uh, so it, it was shown on campus. Uh, I, I did okay in Munzinger, probably in our inter, inter, in our international film series, and mm -hmm. he says he's been recommending it to everybody he uh, he meets who's interested uh, ever since. So. Thank you. Thank you, Skip. <laughs> I appreciate that. I mean, the film is interestingly does, um, especially with new generations coming up, it it, it certainly has, uh, it continues to be back in the world. I mean, it's, it's um, uh, the, the film uh, FTA, which is about um, the, the Jane Fonda, Donald Sutherland tour that, 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 that you know, we, we talk about in Sir No Sir. Uh, that film was recently, actually a year ago, maybe two years ago, time goes quickly, um, was restored and went through a, a, a digital restoration and was re-released uh, by Kino Lorber. And, and in the course of when Kino Lorber re-released that, they also re-released Sir No Sir. And so both of those films are now on Netflix. Um, and and it's very satisfying to see that they have a, a, a continued life. Um, which speaks to the to the continuing relevance of what happened in the 1960s, not to kind of, you know, bank, you know, hit people over the head with it, because I, I know some people do that. But but there is so much to be learned from what happened then and how how how, you know, different movements responded to what was going on in the world. And um, um, there are some folks in Germany now who are hoping to get uh, the film into the hands of uh, Israeli soldiers. So, um, you know, it's it's a uh, it's an interesting dynamic that um, uh, that that goes on with it. And by the way, uh, you know, one of the one of the reasons I think it still stays relevant is be, is is because the um, spitting myth about uh, Vietnam vets and 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 the mythology of the anti-war movement. Um, uh, vilifying and turning on Vietnam vets uh, keeps getting repeated, and it certainly did. Like when when Skip, when you saw the film in two thousand seven, the reason I was able to make the film then was because of the Iraq War, uh, and there were uh, television uh, networks internationally that were very interested in telling the story of American soldiers refusing to fight the war that they were ordered to fight. Um, or or objecting and 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 causing all kinds of problems, um, and that just continues to kind of get regenerated apparently every every generation. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. This, 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 by the way, there there's just today a Wikipedia page was launched about the the spitting myth about the myth of of uh, Vietnam veterans being spat on. It's extremely well. Uh, researched and documented and very interesting if you want to read more about that. Yeah, I, Ron, I, I think you know Ron Carver, right? Uh, Ron's in the... In... Hi, Ron. <laughs> you turn yours, or we can light you off, and then I can let David see Ron. Well, he doesn't have to see me. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I've got two comments. Uh, 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 I got. I think I got. I lost uh, hearing. I'm not hearing Ron's. Call okay, sorry. Right. We've we've had some technical issues here, so <laughs> I apologize for that. Go go ahead, Ron. Yeah. So two comments. One is, uh, I know Nancy Bieberman, the woman who, in Ken Burns' film, said, uh, "It's too bad we call returning veterans uh, baby killers." Uh, I was in at Columbia University with her throughout uh, the time she was there uh, in the anti-war movement. And uh, the truth is she and I and the others never called any veterans baby killers. I I'm going to call her up tomorrow 
and ask her, what the hell was that all about? Because I suspect that she was prompted to say that. We'll, we'll find out, but I want to find out. The other comment is, I was so happy to see in the film, and this is only the 10th and 12th time I've seen it, but uh, the interview with Dave Blaylock, mm. where he talked about uh, when he and his buddy saw the New York Times ad calling with by oh, yeah. whatever, 1,300 uh, folks signed it, uh, urging support for the uh, mobilization march in Washington, D.C. in 1969. Uh, well, here's the interesting story. I I knew Dave Blaylock also. Uh, he and I worked together at a GI coffee house at Fort McClellan, Alabama, for almost a year. And he never told me that story. Hmm. And, and what interests me about that is not that I have any doubt in, in you know, it's well documented, he's well documented. But what it means to me is that there were so many incidents of that type of rebellion, of people refusing to go out in the field one day or wearing armbands, whatever, it didn't occur to him. It, it wasn't special to him. It was just another day of protest while they were in Vietnam. Uh, and I, I just wanted to pass it on as really significant. And I've been in touch with Darnell, who he's talking with there, and also to his daughter. Uh, sadly, uh, Dave Blaylock had a stroke a few years ago. Uh, when our book, Waging Peace in Vietnam, came out, I wanted to get him a copy. I, I wanted to bring him over for one of our events. Uh, but he's... He's so bad off that he can't even, uh, he can't use a computer, he can't talk. It's kind of a shame, but uh, he, he was a great resistor to a lot of them. And another thought about the children, uh, we're gonna have a session here about the legacies of the war next week. And one of the people who will be participating is the daughter of a Vietnam veteran, uh, Heather Bowser whose father was there, uh, was uh, was in contact with Agent Orange himself throughout the, his year there, came back, and like many Vietnam veterans, uh, his child was born with major defects. How many? We don't know how many, but she started an organization that has over 5,000 children of Vietnam veterans with serious medical disabilities. She's able to talk to us, but so many of them like uh, children, grandchildren in Vietnam, so many of them are so damaged neurologically that they can't talk, they can't function uh, as she can. Yeah. the the. The, the, the war crimes committed by the United States in Vietnam uh, exceed almost anything. And Agent Orange was definitely one of them. It was chemical warfare, outlawed all over, you know. And um, uh, the other thing is, is that uh, I, I don't want to get into a discussion about, about uh, Israel and, and Palestine directly, but one thing I keep hearing this argument that that Hamas is is hiding, you know, in in the civilian population. I'm not a supporter of Hamas. Hamas is not the uh, the NLF. It's not. They're not the same as the Viet Cong. But that is exactly the excuse the United States repeated over and over again for destroying villages, bombing villages, killing everyone in the villages. Said, well, there were hi they were hiding an uh, Viet Cong, and therefore their deaths were justified. All of which is against international law. But, um, but anyway, but 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 Ron, when you talk to Nancy, I, I mean, my my assumption is, and this is what's disturbing, is that I think it was sincere what she was saying. I think she actually believed, and and this is the kind of thing that people have come up with. Well, I didn't do that. I didn't I didn't call GIs baby killers. I didn't 
blame them for the war, but someone must have. Otherwise, why would all these stories be out there? Um, yeah. So um, the 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 Wikipedia page uh, on that myth, by the way, is is written by John Kent, who has written a number of Wikipedia pages about the GI movement and and uh, just some, done some excellent research and and it's all there for people to see to, and and read and and very very informative. As is the exhibit that Ron is 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 promoting here. Ron has a quick follow-up. Quick yeah. question is, is well, as I know you, I never ask you, how did you end up at the coffee house at uh, Fort Hood? <laughs> um, uh, I've asked myself that so many times. No, I, um, I had avoided being involved in, in any kind of political things. I was, uh, I, I spent two years, you know, bumming around Europe, um, uh, thinking I was, you know, uh, a, a beat poet. Um, and, and when, when I gave up on that and came home, uh, I went to college at UC Santa Cruz because I, I couldn't think of anything else to do. But by the time I got there, I, I realized that there was nothing. And this was in 1969. Um, I just reached, reached, finally reached a point where I had the, I, I wanted to, to be involved with whatever I could to end the war. And we, we had some very, uh, did, did some very good stuff at Santa Cruz, but Santa Cruz was just like a, an Island. Um, I joined something called the Venceremos Brigade, which was, um, uh, an organized trip to Cuba to spend six weeks cutting sugar cane and then two weeks traveling. And there were, there were like 600 um, American radicals, revolutionaries, anti-war activists, et cetera, et cetera. And I went there partly because I just wanted to see all of these different groups and, and find out what was going on anywhere. And frankly, the only people that made any sense to me at that were the people from the GI movement. I met uh, a couple of people from the Oleo Strut, a couple of people from uh, the uh, coffee house in, in uh, Washington state. And that just immediately said to me, well, this is what, you know, wh who else, who, who's in a better position to uh, interfere with and ultimately end the war than the, than the soldiers. And next thing I knew, I was, you know, in the backseat of a beat up Chevy driven by Dave Klein, who's in the film going about 120 miles an hour down I-35. And I, I remember very vividly thinking I'm never going to get out of there alive. And I spent two years and it, of course, it changed my life tremendously. Thank you. We have just one or two minutes left because we're actually going to get kicked out of our room. Uh, so I'll, I'll limit myself, if I may, to just uh, one of my quick questions, which is um, uh, the sort of, you know, afterlife of the release of the film. So it's come out on Netflix. I think I saw it on Netflix a couple of years ago. I don't remember exactly when it appeared, but that was the first time I had seen the movie. So I wonder, um, you know, what what is the effect of streaming been on, on uh, an independent filmmaker like yourself uh, to get... Um, uh, you know your your uh, your movie scene uh, and 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 into the national conversation. And is there a, a a sort of drawback as well? I sometimes wonder. I was hoping we were going to have a few more people. I don't want to yell at the people who are here because that's counterproductive. I, you know, is, is there a tendency to to retreat from you know those sort of a live screening of an exciting film like this? Because hey, I can always just watch it on Netflix. You know, um, uh, and is there something maybe lost in the in the group uh, viewing of a, of a film? So those are two questions I was thinking about as I was watching. So, well, I mean, you can't have large scale group, you know, group screenings of films. Uh, what is it now? Almost 20 years after the film was made. Um, interestingly, I, I mean, it's it's actually the fact that it is uh, on a platform that that is very widely seen. Uh, and actually, when it was first put up there, it was it was trending, meaning it was, you know, Netflix does not publish um, figures of. Uh, you know, uh, numbers of of screen uh, of pe people who watch the films, but if something's trending, then that means it's it's getting an awful lot of people seeing it, um, who would not see it otherwise. And and um, uh, you know, I think in in that sense, uh, you know, um, it, it's a very it's a very good thing. Um, I, you know, I I I'm I'm kind of go both ways on this whole issue of you know, I, I mean, I'm. 
I'm not enamored with sitting in a theater with 200 people watching a film if I can watch it in bed with my wife. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, but certainly, you know, I mean, when this film came out, which, was, as I said, in the midst of the, of the Iraq war, there were huge screenings all over the world. And it was very important because it, they became it became part of the tumult that was going on against what the United States was doing in Iraq. Um, and, and, uh, you know, in that sense, it played, it played a very, a very good role. And, and to be honest, I think, you know, the fact that there aren't a lot of people that would come out to this is not as much a result of its streaming as a result of people aren't getting off their asses right now in this country. They're not, they're not, they're not taking on things the way they should. I mean, that that's kind of how 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 I see it. Thanks. So we have uh, Suntan Laboratories has a hand up. I'm going to put you in uh, real quickly. We are just about out of time, so it has to be very brief if that's okay. But uh, you should be you should be live there. Uh, yes. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yep. I'll make this very brief. Um, Director Zeiger, I have a quick question for you. Uh, I think I've seen your documentary before. And I have a, a bias in this because I'm I'm actually uh, attending or watching today from the Bay Area. But uh, this is not a direct critique of your documentary, which I think is significant. But there's a more recent one published only two years ago uh, here in the Bay Area called The Boys Who Said No. Mm -hmm. And I think that it reminds me of your documentary. You've probably seen it as well. But I think the one difference that strikes me is that your documentary is about active duty and veterans who uh, challenged the war. But, you know, the boys who said no was about civilians who um, who I think may have done, you know, a little bit better in the sense that they didn't wait until they were in the war or over there to actually change their mind. But they said that they were willing to either go to jail, which is what David Harris did, who just recently passed away at the beginning of this year in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, his wife was Joan Baez at the time. Joan Baez is this other female figure that should be remembered besides, uh, you know, Jane Fonda. But um, either they went to jail. In some cases, they went underground. They may have gone to Canada or they may have even gone, you know, to to Europe and other places. And um, there are books actually published this year on on, you know, people who went to Canada, people who went to Europe. And all of those books are ones that um, I'm trying to interview the authors for the uh, podcast Vietnam Veteran News. Mm -hmm. uh, but I wanted to ask briefly, like, do you think that the boys who said no and the civilians who didn't wait until they went to Vietnam to to protest? Do you think that that would have been better or is that sort of doing it, you know, rather than better late than never, mm -hmm. but not going at all in the first place? Thank you. I don't I wouldn't I wouldn't say one's better than the other. I, I, I think that film is wonderful. I think the the uh, uh, that movement was a tremendous, you know, impact and very important. Everyone, you know, in that situation has to make their own uh, individual decision. The thing is, uh, in terms of the GI movement, and this is this is, you know, most of the drafted GIs um, were, you know, working class. Um, uh, hadn't really thought it's um, they should have, but they hadn't, you know, really kind of thought that much. I mean, most of it, a lot of them came from military families, generation after generation, and uh, they had no reason to object to the war from their not point of view. It's not a, I don't think it's a judgment of one one's more important or better than the other. I think they're both very so very important. We we've hit six thirty and we've 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 run out of our time and people are really coming in and they've got this room so we really do have to break. I'm sorry. So thank you so much, uh, uh, David. And we yeah, for you and, and I have to shut it down. So okay, so, thank you for doing this and uh, yeah. thanks. thanks. I'll be in contact by email. See you. Okay. Bye bye. <laughs>